Uh, let's get started. Uh, so the the exams are now in your hands. Uh, the answers are printed out, but I will have the solutions taped to my door starting after class today, and I will leave them up for 10 days or whatever, two weeks. Um, and they, I will do an adjustment on this score uh, after I grade the extra credit uh, homework. And that will, in fact, help the score. However, I want you to keep in mind that in order to qualify for an A or B, the average of the three exams, in order to qualify for at least a B minus, the average of the three exams has to be 50% or better. So at 50% or better is the requirement, and that's based on the test score, not on the extra credit added to the exam. Okay? Um, so um, uh, obviously, I, I would expect that we would have maybe 12 questions on the NEST exam. There'll be 20 to 25 questions on the final. So you have lots of opportunity to make up if you got a three or a four on this one. Right? If you got a three or a four, you're still only two questions away from getting 50% average to meet the requirement. But I am not going to add that extra credit problem to count towards that, that requirement. It will count <coughs> towards your total cumulative score, and it will boost your score up above a B minus or a B or a B plus. That will still be, that will still be true, and your weighted total, total will improve. Okay? So that's, that's the, the, basic, uh, the basic idea of, of this, uh, of, of, of what we're talking about. Now, <coughs> along the remarks, or some of the remarks that I think I uh, would like to say, and, and I mean, I, I think you can kind of clarify what you did wrong when you, and what you did right, hopefully, maybe, you know, looking at what you did right is also a good thing to look at. Um, but uh, learning from mistakes is obviously your best way to improve. Uh, I would expect to, that you should, you should expect to see similar types of problems on the final exam as part of the final, because the final is cumulative. So I think it's, it's well worth your time to study the material. Um, now, um, let me make a, a, a couple of comments that, or observations that uh, I, I had on, on a couple of the problems. Um, what was interesting to me was that most people got number two correct. And number two was the double slit experiment. Um, I have six pins here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, number two was one that we worked in class. It, had, it applied the double slit experiment, and people did reasonably well. <clears throat> and it was based on the idea of looking for the interference minimum that occurs in a double slit phenomenon. So if my intensity pattern is something like this, and I'm looking for a dip in the intensity, and or what we call a dead zone, okay. then the condition for finding this dip in intensity, so this is I of theta, for example, um, where the distance from the origin is the size of the amount of the intensity, then the condition is that d sine theta is equal to sine theta 1 min is equal to lambda over 2d where D is the space. And most people got that right. This is where the minimum occurs for, uh, uh, for um, uh, the, the, the minimum occurs for a, a double slit phenomenon. But then we go to problem number the three. And I want to show to you that problem number three is the same as problem number two, at least in the abstract and in the equations, but here, most of the people missed the problem. So here, most of the people got the problem. But number three, uh, we're calculating the, uh, you're asked to calculate the, uh, in this case, the, uh, the wavelength of light, in which you know what is the uh, position of the first minimum. Right? So the minimums do, so you get it wrong. Above. OK. 
Okay? Condition for the first minimum is that the same as before. D sine theta 1 min is equal to uh, lambda over 2D. Uh, did I do that right? Yeah, lambda over 2D, where D is this, this, this distance. And this is given to you as, um, as 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5 millimeters is equal to D, right? So basically, uh, now what I have to do, no, did I do this right? D sine theta is equal to lambda over two, sorry. D sine theta, no one man is lambda over two. Uh, well, same problem here, I saw it. extra factor of D, my mistake. D sine theta one min is lambda over two. D sine theta min lambda over two. I use the same equation and solve for, you're given this quantity, you're given this quantity, solve for lambda. Solve for lambda, okay? Um, here, what you do is you are solving for theta. Solve for theta. Another bad pen. Okay, so when you look at this, you need to look and say, you know, uh, there, 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 this should indicate to you that there was some concept missing in, in what these equations are saying. Okay, I mean, don't don't get the idea that just because you can write down the equation and you can identify what the value, what, what d means and what theta means, what lambda means, that you can solve a problem. You have to understand what the equation is saying. This is saying that when the path difference between the two waves is equal to a half integer of a, of a wavelength, then I get destructive interference. Okay? If you, if you look at it and say, uh, let's see, he gave me d, he gave me lambda, where's theta? Uh, in other words, that might be a good way to start the problem, but uh, you, you have to, uh, you, you have to understand the meaning of the equations. So um, I, I, don't, I don't know that if, if, if that helps, but uh, I, I, I think that in order to do better, it does take more work. I mean, if you, again, you've got to be putting your six hours in a week. And, and if you're not, and you're you know, um, spending 40 minutes on the homework and not reading the book or the, or the notes, then, then it's going it's to show up on the exam. These problems, these two, now I want you to see are back, in fact the same problem. Right? Here, everybody got this one right. Here, everybody, you know, 70, 80% got this right. Here, 70, 80% got this wrong. Right? And now that I've shown it to you, it's probably clear. But uh, it's part of the thinking that you need to get used to. Also, remember, this is a very visual, uh, all of physics is very visual uh, effect, a very visual, um, it helps to see things visually. So you know, you always want to draw a picture before you solve the problem. You know, what, what are we looking for? Now, to, if I look at this from a 30,000 foot level on the course material for this section, this optics, and I realize that this overlooks a lot of, you know, simplifies things, but if you look at it from a very high level, okay, then what are we generally looking for? We're either trying to find the distance between slits or between atoms, we're trying to solve for the angle in which there was a max or a minimum, or we're trying to solve for the wavelength. Right? All these problems well, all come down to those three things. Now, the, the details of that are specific. I'm sorry, um, you have to turn your cell phone off up there. Yeah. My calculator. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm so used to telling people. My apologies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my wife has one like that, so it could happen. Um, well, the iPhone 6S, but anyway. Um, so, and anyway, um, you know, the, this is a part of, of, of seeing what it is that we're, that we're after, and so, you know, that hopefully that, that, will, that, that will help. Um, now, let me mention one other problem. Uh, that was problem number 10. Um, most of the people missed the, um, Missed this one as well, um, and basically a muon is traveling through the lab at 0.9 c. It decays and emits an electron going the opposite direction at 0.1 c, and we want to know what is its speed in the lab frame. Right now, 
there was a homework problem that did use exactly this equation. But I'll work this one instead. But you should go back and compare this to the homework problem, okay? Because they were they were extremely, extremely, extremely similar. So in the homework, I mean, not homework. In, in, in this problem, the basic idea is that uh, we have a transformation of velocities, and the the the, the velocity equations are either. Ux equals ux. I'll write down one of them down, which would have to be the one that we're, that, we're, uh, that we're going to use. Ux prime plus v, and I'll write down what the uh, one plus v ux, and I'll write down what this means in just a second. Okay. So the the, the equation refers to the geometric picture of here's a person sitting in the lab, right, okay? and here's a muon flying by. He's an s prime. The muon is traveling at a velocity v equals to 0.9 c, and in s prime, he emits an electron going in the opposite direction of, of u x prime, so the speed of the, of the electron in the s prime frame, so this is the muon rest frame. This is the muon rest frame. That this one, this u x prime, is minus 0 0.1 times c. Okay. Now, if I wanted the problem is what is the velocity of the electron as seen by a person in S? Well, that's given by this equation. The, the velocity that the person in the lab sees is going to be u x prime plus v divided by one plus v times u x prime divided by c squared. Okay. Now, I've got values for x prime. I've got values for v. And so I get that this is equal to minus or plus uh, 0.9c minus 0.1. I'm sorry, it is ux prime. ux prime is minus 0.1c plus 0.9c divided by 1 plus, but ah, ux prime is negative, right? And so I get that this is minus 0.1 times 0.9, which is 0.88. That should have been the same as your homework problem. Now, the interesting thing to me is that everyone got the homework problem correct. It used the same equation, and 80% missed it on the exam. Now, maybe that was because it was problem number 10, and you were still working on problem number 8, which brings me back to my other point. Always go for the low-lying low -lying fruit on the tree first. Right? All problems are equally weighted. Once you spend more than five minutes on a problem, move on. Okay? You know, I can't, I can't, I can't just always put the easy ones up front and the hard ones at the end. But in my view, this was an easy one. Uh, given that everyone got it right on the homework. Right? So, um, okay. I think I, I think I should stop there and and, um, and go on. If they have any questions, I'd be glad to um, take them on that. Um, yeah, so take a look at the exam, the solutions on my, on my, on my door after the class. I'll leave them up there. You can come back anytime. Next, not next week, of course, but they're gone, but the week after or this week. You can, you can take photos of them. I just, I just don't want them flowing around the internet on the website. Okay. All right. Everybody's good, right? We're good with this? You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I know I, I, always get, I always get the argument, well, you know, Dr. Pupitan, your questions are not like the homework questions. Um, yes, the words are different. I, I do phrase things differently. Um, I feel like I have to do that. I mean, I've actually thought about putting homework problems on the exam. Maybe that's a good idea to put a couple of them on uh, without changing anything. <laughs> but, you know, it, it makes me worry that, uh, that did that that, uh, that it'd be easy not to understand the concept if if we're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, anyway, it's the best I can do. I have to change something, so I change the wording. But like all the homework, you're either solving for angle, you're solving for the distance between the slits, or uh, you're solving for the wavelength. Okay? And that part's the same. Right? So anyway, do the best you can. If you're not putting in six hours, start putting in six hours. Work extra problems. There are 
odd number of problems in the book with answers in the back, look at similar ones because I do ask similar type problems. I'm not going to ask you a type of problem uh, that I think that we haven't discussed it, you know, had a homework problem to, to work on. Okay, good. So let's go on. All right, so um, let's, let's take a uh, label off to, or start up with where we left off last time. Um, so last time we were, we were talking about uh, the Compton scatter. And so come back to this board later. These boards are so ugly in their ability to be cleaned. This one looks a little better, so I'll start there. Um, okay, so view a little bit where we left off. So uh, last time we had talked about and finished deriving the equation for Compton scattering. So let's review again what that is, Compton scattering. Um, and with Compton scattering, uh, the wavelength comes in like this, lambda. Um, it, uh, the, the photon hits an electron. We are describing this as a, uh, a bit of what I call a billiard ball collision. Um, <coughs> The electron recoils like the eight ball on the pool table. Uh, the cue ball is scattered and it comes off with a lower energy or momentum. So uh, we, we have the general equations that the energy of a photon is equal to H times the frequency, which is HC divided by lambda. Um, and by the way, this we said was also equal to P times the momentum of the photon times the uh, times the speed of light, so we get a, a, a derived relationship that uh, the momentum of the, so this is momentum of the photon, right? This is a particle momentum, and it has a momentum equal to h divided by lambda. Okay. And when it scatters, okay, so the electron here is sitting here on the on the table. This scatters and to a new wavelength lambda prime, and it comes off at an angle phi with respect to the uh, the incident uh, photon, and the electron recoils with an angle theta. Right? And we derived a relationship, or at least showed you how to derive the relationship, that the scattered photon is related to the angle of its scattering. Uh, by the Compton equation, which says that lambda prime is equal to lambda uh, <coughs> plus a constant h over me times c times 1 minus cosine of phi. So this says that if I, if I know the incident photon energy or wavelength, right, either the energy or the wavelength, uh, and I know the angle that it's scattered, I can calculate what the new uh, lambda prime or the new energy or the new momentum is going to be. So, you know, we can write that P prime, P gamma prime is equal to H over lambda prime and E gamma prime is equal to um, H, uh, H, yeah, I'm sorry, is equal to P. Well, that's true too, but it's equal to P gamma prime times c, right? So we, we have these equations. Um, and furthermore, what we can do is simplify this. What I'm going to do is I multiply by h by c on numerator and denominator. And uh, we'll derive this a little bit later. But this becomes plus 0.00243 nanometers. So I didn't put the red like this, times 1 minus cosine of phi. Okay. And phi is the angle of the photon, theta is the angle of the electron. Or in billiard ball parlance, 
uh, theta is the angle of the eight ball and phi is the angle of the cube ball. The white, the white ball on the table, right? So um, this becomes the equation that we have to work with. And also, uh, once we calculate what the new lambda prime is uh, from, from, from the angle of scattering, notice that I can also get what the energy of the electron is as well because that's going to be different to equal to the difference of the incident energy, which is hc over lambda minus hc over lambda prime. Right. So once I'm, I know what, uh, what phi is, I know what lambda prime is, and so I know what the energy of the recoil electron is. Right. So I've got more information about the two ball, the, 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 the two billiard ball scattering problem. Right? All right, now, um, what, what else can we infer about, infer about this? Well, let's look at two extreme examples of a billiard ball collision. One is the one I will call direct hit. And direct hit is one in which um, the, the electron goes forward with maximum with maximum energy goes forward with electron energy max right it's max why because if the electron has a direct hit the way to get the most energy transferred to the to the electron is the incident energy the incident photon hits it and there will also either, either absorbs all of its energy, which it cannot do, or it will emit a, 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 a photon of lesser energy, lambda prime, in the backward direction. Okay? And in the meantime, in this particular hit, the electron goes forward with Ek max, or I'll call it E electron, E electron max. Right? I mean, we all agree that when you have a billiard ball collision and you want the ball to go fast as possible, it's a direct hit, maximum energy transfer, hit it head on. Right? In this case, with the photon recoiling backwards, notice I give it even more momentum because I, I've actually recoiled, this, uh, the, 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 there's some recoil in the backward direction, but in any case, this is going to occur uh, when phi is equal to 180 degrees. Right? So in other words, uh, the angle of scatter is for a direct hit is when this when the photon goes off in the backward direction. Right? And this angle phi is 180 degrees. That's a direct hit. Right? When, when, the, when the recoil photon comes flying backwards, then the, the eight ball has got the maximum energy forward. That's the electron. Okay, that's the electron. Right. So, uh, the direct hit, electron goes forward. Uh, we can see that because notice that here, this quantity represents delta lambda, lambda prime minus lambda is in here, and I want that to be maximum, and that'll be maximum when phi equals 180 degrees, or one minus cosine phi is equal to two. Okay, so now what I have is uh, lambda prime, is equal to lambda plus 0 0.00486 nanometers. Right? And now, once I tell you what lambda is, I can, of course, calculate lambda prime. And I, once I know lambda prime, I can use this equation and tell you how much energy that the electron got. And we'll work out, we'll work out an example of that uh, shortly here. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, before we go any further, um, I've already worked out this constant for you, but uh, the quantity HC occurs so often in the rest of our work in this class that uh, we'll, just, we'll just spell it out. This is 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 uh, EV seconds. That's the value of H. And I'm going to multiply that times C, which is three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second. And 
I'm going to use the special units then uh, when I multiply these two together of 1200 becomes 1240 um, uh, EV nanometers. So that's the value I use for, for HC. That will be helpful in, 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 in future cal calculations. Um, okay, this is a direct hit. Now, there's another one that we will call a grazing hit, right? A grazing hit is one in which uh, this electron is, is basically uh, the eight ball that I want to hit into the side pocket. Okay? So imagine that um, I have my billiard ball table like here, uh, my eight ball is sitting right here, and I want to hit the eight ball into the side pocket. Okay? That's called a grazing hit. Right? Everyone who's played pool knows that if, you, if you're shooting from this side of the table and you want this ball to go into this pocket, you have to do it with a grazing hit. And furthermore, the energy of that particle is going to be really low compared to a direct hit. Right? And so we'll find out that that is actually the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the case as well. But uh, for a grazing hit, um, let me write that out. is one in which the, the cue ball essentially goes almost straight ahead. There's a little bit of energy transfer, so it gets scattered at a very, very small angle, but the angle phi is extremely small. Right? So uh, in that particular case, we have that uh, the limit in this equation right here, the limit at phi goes to zero degrees, then we have the grazing hit, and one minus cosine phi goes to zero, so delta lambda prime goes to zero. We, I'm sorry, delta lambda goes to zero, which is, which is lambda prime minus lambda goes to zero, and therefore the energy of the electron goes to zero. Right? And in fact, that's usually what we observe in a grazing hit. That uh, on, the, on the table, you can certainly get this to go into the side pocket, but it dribbles off very, very slowly. Right? It, 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 it takes up an extremely small amount of energy by, 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 by doing that. So, um, so those, are, those are the two extreme examples of, the, of, of, the, of the, what we call the the pool table analogy, and um, we'll work a couple examples. But first of all, there's one more equation that I think is important, and that is that um, we can also solve for the relationship between the scattered angle phi. Uh, remember, we have four four unknowns and three equations, so I can I can I can either express phi in terms of lambda prime. I can express phi in terms of the kinetic energy. I can do any two, any two variables I can, I can match off in, and, and, and plot their, their correlation. So the correlation with angle then is that, um, the correlation with angle is that if I were to plot the angle scattered of the electron versus the angle scattered of the photon, phi, so this is phi of the photon, then um, what, I, what I will see is that at phi equals zero, which is the grazing hit, that the phi of the electron is 90 degrees. And as the angle of the scattered photon approaches 180 degrees, then the angle of the uh, electron goes to zero. And I get a curve that looks like this. So this is the condition for grazing hit, which is zero. And in this case, the kinetic energy of the electron goes to a maximum. 
Right? And in between, you can do anything else. Now, if I were to ask you on the pool hall table, if it's possible to make the eight ball go in the backward direction, what would you say? No. What's the largest angle that the eight ball can be uh, deflected from? From the, uh, from the direction of the, of the cue ball. Huh? What's the largest angle that, I mean, the, 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 the eight ball can go in the forward direction of the direct hit. It can go into the side pocket. Can it go backwards? Can it go off like this? No. So what's the maximum angle? 90. 90. Right. So we you know that theta max, I'm not drawing this very well. Theta max, theta max equal to 90 degrees. Okay? That is this condition right here. There's theta max, 90 degrees. Okay? So as pictorially what's happening is that as the, as the uh, scatter angle of the photon begins to increase, the electron goes from a 90 degree scatter to a more and more forward degree scatter. So if the deflected uh, photon uh, ends up going to a larger angle phi, the electron angle goes to zero. Okay? So that's the correlation. As phi increases from zero to 180, the electron recoil angle goes from 90 to zero. And that's what this plot shows. So let's uh, help you think about this in terms of billiard balls, something we'll all hopefully have to spend enough time with to uh, understand how, how two balls collide on a, on a table. Okay? Any questions on this so far? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so now um, I, th I think it's, it's worth doing a couple examples. Um, uh, to, to show you a little bit uh, about, about how this works. So uh, uh, some of these problems are also on Blackboard, by the way, so you can actually go there to, to see them. Um, so let's look at what is the, no, what is the maximum uh, electron energy? What is uh, electron, what is the maximum? maximum electron energy when struck, not stuck, struck, struck by 200 keV, uh, 200 keV uh, photon. And you'll notice that a lot of these problems that we're dealing with are in the KEV range because this equation uh, was verified and is confirmed to work primarily in the X-ray region. X-ray, X-ray region. And the wavelength region for X-rays uh, is anywhere from one nanometer up down to uh, a, a, pico nan a picometer, so somewhere in the range of that, you know, sub nanometer wavelength range is the is the range is the wavelength of photons. But we'll we'll give you that land anyway. But just keep clear, uh, this is most likely to occur in the X-ray region uh, of the of the of, of the spectrum. So we're going to use those as an example. Uh, and what angle? So so first of all, what is the maximum energy? Okay, well. Uh, let's see. It's clear that in order to calculate the, well, first of all, the maximum energy occurs for a direct hit, right? So this means that phi is equal to 180 degrees, which means that uh, lambda prime is equal to lambda plus 0 0.00243, which is this constant, uh, H over MEC, uh, nanometers and the and the, the the angle constant so one minus negative one when I calculate one minus cosine phi 
and I can I can I can calculate this. Right? So, uh, what do I need? Well, first of all, if I'm going to calculate the electron energy, I need to calculate the wavelength. Right? At first, I got to calculate the wavelength for the incident light. Then I got to calculate the wavelength of the scattered light, and then I've got to calculate what is the energy of the electron in terms of hc over lambda minus hc over lambda prime. Because this is the incident photon energy, this is the scattered photon energy, right? So that represents energy conservation, right? So that's the path to getting there, is, is, to, is to calculate this. So let's see, let's start with lambda. Okay, so I'm gonna use this value of hc that we've written down. Uh, it's a useful one to keep in mind. And so I get that lambda is equal to, and I'm going to use different units of EV, KV to make things simple, but 1240 EV is 1.24 KV. Okay? So I'm going to, and I've got my photon energy here, so I want to calculate the wavelength because this is the, this is the photon energy. So I have 1.24 KEV nanometer uh, divided by, uh, 200 keV is the photon energy, and this is what I call Hc over lambda. Uh, I'm sorry, Hc over over E. Right? So E equals Hc over lambda. Lambda is equal to Hc over E. E is E is is 200. So okay, so I can put that in there, and then I get uh, that this is equal to this wavelength is equal to 0 0.0062 uh, nanometers. And so now I'm in a position to calculate lambda prime, and lambda prime is equal to uh, lambda 0 0.002, 0, 0 0.0062 uh, plus 0 0.00243 uh, times one minus cosine phi, which is two, and this becomes equal to 0 0.011 nanometer. Okay. So that gives me a value of lambda prime. Now I need to calculate this term. This is E gamma prime, right? What is the, the recoil energy? Because I'm gonna subtract it from this term, which is my incident energy, which is 200 keV, so I need the photon energy in KeV as well, or electron volts. So I can do that. Um, <clears throat> I can calculate that and I get that um, e, gamma um, e, e gamma prime is equal to 1.24 KeV nanometer divided by lambda prime, which is 0 0.011 nanometer and so I get that uh, this is 112.7 uh, keV. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what is the energy of the the maximum energy of the recoil energy of the recoil electron? The eK, the electron energy max is then equal to 200 minus 112.7, which is equal to 87.3 keV. 87.3 keV. So uh, the maximum kinetic energy of the electron is 87.3 keV. Think of any, I'm going to ask a question, think about this. Is it clear so far what I'm doing? I know the maximum, the ma the maximum that, the, that the electron can get is what's called a direct hit. It's when the uh, scattered angle is 180 degrees. That gives me a way to calculate lambda prime. I can then calculate what the uh, recoil energy is. And the difference of those two energies is the energy of the electron.
there will be an exam question like this, by the way. Maybe not with maximum kinetic energy, but there'll be a couple. So, and you'll have a lot of practice ones as well from the chapter that I'm going to assign. So you'll get some experience with it. Okay. Um, okay. Now, okay. Now let's ask question. What, what is the velocity of this electron? Right? Now we have to go back to kinematics. Right? That's on the assignment that's due tonight. So if you haven't worked that assignment, don't delay anymore. I've only got uh, uh, eight and a half more hours or nine hours left, right? Nine, nine and a quarter hours, okay? All right, um, well, let's see. There's some various ways to do this. The easiest way I like to do this, once I know kinetic energy, and I know this is an electron, is that the kinetic energy is equal to the rest mass energy, m naught c squared, times gamma minus one, and I can always get gamma, I can always get velocity from gamma, right? Because gamma is, is, is the Lorentz factor, right? So this is an easy way to get that. So um, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get gamma uh, is equal to one plus uh, EK is 87.3 divided by, um, uh, divided by KEV divided by, remember, m naught c squared is a value you should learn or put on your piece of paper for the three particles that we will discuss in the course, for the electron, for the proton, and for the neutron. Those are the only three particles we need to worry about. This one for the electron is 511 keV. So uh, this is going to be divided by 511 keV because it's an electron. Somebody can get their calculator out and tell me if they can uh, come up with a uh, value before I do. Probably since you will, since I can't even find a calculator. Um, does anybody have a calculator? Please let me know as soon as you have it. One point one seven. One point one seven, which is equal to uh, one over the square root of one minus beta squared. So I can clearly get what beta is because now beta is equal to the square root of one minus one over gamma squared. So this is equal to the square root of one minus one over one point one seven squared. And somebody can calculate that for me. Square root of 0.875, if anyone knows what that is. 0 0.52. There we go. Okay. So, what's the velocity of an electron? Uh, energy 83 keV, uh, 87 keV, 0.5 times the speed of light. Right? So, we can always get a, we, it's always good to be able to get a velocity from a kinetic energy. Right? It gives you a feel for how fast things are moving relative, relative to the speed of light. So anyway, this was not the problem at hand, but it uh, kind of a, a, a side problem. Okay. Now, uh, let's suppose that um, we want to do another one, and that is, um, let's suppose I have one that is, right here. A 511 keV photon, so supposing I have, oh, by the way, so I, did, I forgot to mention one more formula, uh, and that is the equation of this curve. So notice that phi and theta are correlated with each other in the way we describe. There's also a formula for that, which I'll write out, that the tangent of the angle of the uh, an electron is equal to the sine of the angle of the photon divided by 
be one minus cosine of the photon angle times a quantity called one plus alpha. Now, um, this is derivable from the, this comes also from the, uh, from the uh, energy momentum conservation equations. You'll remember that in the conservation of momentum, there's a cosine theta term uh, for, the, uh, for the x component of the electron momentum. There's a sine theta term for the uh, y component of the uh, electron momentum. And by taking the ratio, I can get the tangent. And it takes some algebra. But this equation describes, describes this curve right here. So this curve is described by this. And one other term that is not given to you, which is alpha. And alpha is equal to the energy of the photon divided by 511 keV, which happens to be the rest mass of the electron. So this becomes the uh, number for, uh, for alpha. So you can calculate it based on that. Uh, that's so let's suppose that uh, we said earlier on that if we had a grazing hit, so in other words, let's say that um, um, that the um, that that phi is a very small number, then we'll say it's of order, let's say, two degrees, for example. Then um, uh, we would expect that the angle of recoil is close to 90 degrees for the electron. The electron should come off at close to 90 degrees. And its energy should be very, very low. Right? Its energy should be very, very low. So we can, we can calculate that and, uh, and, and verify that uh, through, our, through our equations. So now I want to ask, I have a problem where I'm going to ask the question of where, um, So now I'm going to take a, suppose a uh, 511 keV photon. So notice I picked the, ma the, the mass energy of the electron, but this is equal actually to the photon energy. Uh, 511 keV photon um, scatters at two degrees. At two degrees. Right? And two degrees is equal to the angle phi. And uh, I want to calculate. One know is what is the energy of the the energy uh, and the angle. And the angle of the electron. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. So the first thing I'm going to do um, to try to get this is to um, <clears throat> first thing I'm going to do is to try to get the the energy of the electron. So what do I need to know for the energy of the electron? I know the incident photon energy, and I know that the electron energy is equal to the incident energy minus the scattered photon energy. Right? So this is I know this number. So I know what the incident is. What is E gamma prime? Well, I've got to calculate lambda prime first. So I'll calculate lambda prime, and that's equal to uh, lambda plus 0 0.00243 nanometers uh, times one minus cosine of two degrees. And if I do the algebra and the math right, then I get that this is equal to 0 0.00 Two, uh, two, four, point zero zero two, four, three, one nanometers. Okay, and from this, then I can calculate what the the uh, the electron recoil energy is. Now remember, this is a grazing hit, right? So I'm now looking at the one where I'm describing. This is the grazing hit. Right? Why? Because the scattering angle is almost equal to zero. So basically, it just boom, touches the eight ball, and the eight ball recoils, we think, at 90 degrees, or close to it. Right? So I first of all got to calculate what is the energy of the scattered photon, and that's given by E gamma prime. So um, 
uh, I put in my equation 1.24 keV uh, nanometers. That's the value of Hc. I divided by lambda prime, which is 0 0.0. 0, 2, 4, 3, 1, and that becomes 509.98. Let's call it 510. And so I get that the energy of the electron is equal to 511 minus 510, which is equal to 1 keV which means that it only takes away 0.2% of the energy of the photon. So out of that 500 keV of incident kinetic energy, the electron only got 1 keV. Right? That's 2 tenths of a percent. That's a crazy kid. Right? The electron recoils slowly compared to a direct hit. Right? Um, so remember, a direct hit, we had 87 keV, but that was for the incident of 200. If this incident was 500, this number would probably be double that, and that's a very, or more, but that's still a very large number compared to 1 keV, all right? So now we want to say, well, what is the angle of the, of the recoil? So I use my formula, the tangent of, the, of, of theta is equal to, Angular theta is equal to, uh, my formula is sine of two degrees. And then I have one minus cosine of two degrees times one plus alpha. Alpha is the incident energy divided by 511. Right? So the incident energy divided by 511 is actually one. So I choose this one so that this number is exactly equal to 511. So alpha is equal to 1 in this case. Okay. So 1 plus alpha is equal to 2. And so um, this becomes divided by 2. And uh, I'll leave this for you to verify that this gives me theta equal to 88 degrees. Hence, grazing in. Okay. So that's how you solve these problems. That, that's, that's how you solve the problems. Okay. And you'll have some experience with this in Tangent of theta is 28.64. So tangent of this is equal to 28.64, which then implies that theta is equal to 88. Mm -hmm. So large angle recoil, very slow. Direct hit, no, you know, zero degrees, takes, takes the energy in the forward direction, the electron moves in the forward direction, it gets the maximum energy transfer. Anything in between is between those two, those two extremes. Right? And as phi goes from 0 to 180, 0, the electron is at 90. As phi increases this way, the electron momentum vector moves much more closer to the forward direction. And at 180, it's a direct hit. Okay. Grazing hit. Here, not too this is grazing hit. Phi is increasing. Theta is decreasing. Phi goes to 180, theta goes to zero. Kinetic energy goes from zero up to the maximum. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to erase my board here for the next section. It's good to give you some time to think, otherwise I just race through this stuff. And it is hard stuff. Mm -hmm. 
This was another Nobel Prize. So black body radiation, Planck gets a Nobel Prize. Uh, photoelectric effect, Einstein gets a, photo, gets a Nobel Prize. Uh, Compton scattering, Compton gets a Nobel Prize. The next one we're talking about is Davison Germer, he gets a Nobel Prize. At this point, it's like one Nobel Prize after the other. It's like, you know, it was too bad we weren't born in the 20s. They were handing them out like candy. <laughs> well, it was, they were in a good, you know, it was a lucky, it, you know, you, you have to be hardworking and smart, but you also have to be born at the right time. <laughs> I mean, there are really a lot of things that are just beyond your control. And the only thing you do is work with the ones that are in your control. You know, Einstein said, you know, brilliance is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. But I would have liked to have had his 1% inspir of, uh, inspiration. His 1% is worth 90% of mine. <laughs> Okay, oh, more than that. Okay, so now we're going to go move to the next section, which is um, the wave property of particles. So up till now, um, what we have talked about is is the way is, is the is the is, is the particle property of waves. So this whole discussion, since black body is looking at the light, the, 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 the photon, we're looking at the photon or the particle property, well, two of them gone. This is the uh, particle properties we've been looking at. Here's the particle properties of, uh, of, of, of waves, right? Particle properties of waves, of light waves. Right? And now we're going to approach a different subject, which is what about, is it possible that particles have wave properties? Uh, wave properties. Now, in in 1920s or so, um, there was a, uh, a a physicist by the name of De Broglie, and uh, he, he came up with what we now call the De Broglie. By the way, particles have wave properties? Question mark. Okay, this is this is a question mark, right? And de Broglie wanted to uh, investigate that and said, well, um, if photons have a associated momentum uh, related to their wavelength, so that the P of the photon is equal to H divided by its wavelength, then is it possible that uh, real particles, massive particles, massive particles, um, have a wavelength, have lambda, which also obeys this equation, and they have a wave property as well, and we'll describe this as lambda is equal to h divided by, by the momentum. Uh, except now it's not the photon. Uh, now we'll call it the electron, although it could be a proton or a neutron, for that matter. Is it possible that massive particles also have H and behave like waves? And behave. Oh, sorry. And behave like waves. That's the that's the question, right? Do they, is that is that possible? Right. De Broglie wrote this equation down and said. Maybe the equation that works for photons also works for particles. And by the way, we can say that the momentum of the electron is equal to the mass of the electron times its velocity. Okay? And we'll assume it's non-relativistic and the mass increase here. We can still we can make this relativistic, but let's we'll, we'll look at non-relativistic first. Okay. So, 
is it possible that we could actually have nature provides symmetry? This works in describing the particle properties of the electromagnetic wave. This lambda is the lambda of the magnetic wave. And particles have a wavelength that's connected with their momentum. Then the same equation applies for particles of light as it does for particles of, of, of matter. Right? So he, 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 he wrote this down, and he, he sent it to Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein looked at it and said, looks good. I, I, think, I think there might be something to this. I think we should investigate. So he went ahead and published it. And as far as I know, it's the only thing of major significance that de Broglie did, but it was a major stepping point. Uh, Einstein later re re moved, he later moved, got moved to regret this decision, but for now he says, yeah, I, I like it, let's go with it, okay? So how do you verify that particles act like waves? How do you verify? Well, the experiment that was done, this is in your handout, was, was done by uh, two physicists by the name of Davison and German. And uh, what they did was, I'm not going to use the space, I may actually need this here. It's, it's written for you already back there, so I'm not going to uh, use this space for the, for the actual experiment. So their experiment was the following. You'll, rec you'll recall that we had looked at the X-ray diffraction of, of, of light from uh, crystals. And crystals had various atomic centers related to them. And uh, remember, we brought these photon, the, the X-rays in at an angle phi, and you had an exam problem with this, and they scatter off at angle phi. And at certain magic angles of the X-rays coming in, they all arrive at one angle. There are no other angles that, that get scattered. And that was because of we calculated a diffraction maximum. There was a maximum interference. Right? So what does that, that, that look like? Well, for their experiment, they did the beam directions a little bit differently, but the idea was still the same. What they did was uh, they brought the electron beams in this way, head on. Could someone close that door up there? I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm, can barely hear myself talk with the noise. Anyway, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, uh, we, 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 what they did was to bring the electron beam straight in and scatter off of, of crystal, which I believe was nickel at the time. And now what happens is we look at um, the scattered, the scattered uh, electrons. Some of the electrons will scatter at an angle. But notice that if we draw the direction to the detector, uh, the, the scattering occurs at a given angle, and if that angle is at a particular direction, we'll call it phi, um, such that this path difference from here to here is an integral number of wavelengths. So this difference from here to here is, this path difference is d times sine phi, where uh, D is the spacing between the uh, between the elements. So D is the spacing between the uh, the atomic nuclei and or the atomic lattice. And this line segment right here is D sine phi. Whenever that is equal to some integral multiple of m times the wavelength, we expect there to be maximum uh, constructive interference. We expect that these two waves, when they arrive at the, the destination, will arrive in phase, and this will be an intensity maximum. And I have another bad can. That will be that will be that will be an intensity maximum. So we can calculate um, the, uh, the, the this very very, very, very simply. Uh, we take a particular example, and the example we're going to, to choose is one in which uh, the atomic spacing was equal to 0 0.3 nanometers. And um, uh, the momentum of the electrons was chosen 
so that I want to have a wavelength lambda equal to 0.12 nanometers. And uh, I expect there to be constructive interference for, let's say, m equals 1 when sine phi 1 maximum, which is the first maximum, is equal to lambda over d, which is 0.12 nanometers, uh, divided by, by d. Now, d in this case was 0.3 nanometers. Now, I forgot to tell you how I got this lambda. Lambda is obtained from the de Broglie relation, which says that lambda is equal to h over p. So if I want to get a, 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 the, the correct lambda in my experiment, and by correct I mean one in which lambda is less than d, because you can see from the equation that d sine phi m equals lambda means, of course, that lambda has to be less than d, right? If I'm going to have at least one intensity maximum. So I choose one where lambda is about one third of d, roughly, right? So that means I have to choose the momentum of the electron. Because the way I control the wavelength is to control the momentum. Right now, I don't even know what the wavelength is. It's not the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave. But there does seem to be an interference effect that is correlated with this wavelength that is correctly described by the interference condition uh, that, we've written, that we've written out before. Or d sine theta m equals m times lambda, right? I could do m. That's probably more and more accurate. So this is cl clearly something which I can now control. It turns out that if I control, if I make the kinetic energy equal to 100 electron volts, which was the energy of the electron, and that gives me a momentum P, which was equal to 10.1 keV over C. So you remember that we're using uh, momentum units in EV over C. That's very convenient because HC is also in EV. So this is the, if I choose that, then I can get the correct lambda, which is equal to 0.12 nanometers. OK? That is 0.12 nanometers. OK, now I do the experiment, and I find that I get a first order maximum, that in fact there is a maximum intensity of scattered electrons. And that's what we mean here, is the maximum intensity of scattered electrons. Um, and then it occurs at the one angle which we've just calculated from right here. It does, in fact, occur at 0.12 nanometers divided by 0. I don't need to repeat this over and over again. This gives me already. Phi is equal to 24 degrees. Okay. Furthermore, I can look at the second order maximum, and I can find that there's also a maximum at the first one is at 23 degrees, um, except that I may have made one small mistake here, guys. This angle is phi instead of this angle, so it's this angle which is which is phi. Sorry about that. And there's another angle, which I call sine phi 2, which is equal to 2 times 0 0.12 divided by 0 0.3, 0 0.3. And that gives me that there's a second intensity maximum at an angle of 53 degrees. And there are, there is no, there is no third maximum. Why? Because sine theta is greater than one. Sine, the sine of the sine. When sine is greater than one, you can, there's no solution. It turned out that the experiment was able to confirm there was an intensity maximum, phi one, at 24 degrees. They, they, they also swung their detector out here to 54 to 53 degrees. And there was another intensity maximum a big spike in the, in the x-ray, in the electron signal. So the electrons produced diffraction maximum, 
exactly as x-rays of that wavelength would. Right? In other words, we were able to confirm that electrons give a diffraction maxima the same way that x-rays give diffraction maxima when scattering off of a crystal. Why x-rays? Well, these atomic spacings are very small. I don't have a control over them. They're of order of one or less nanometers. So I have to use a wavelength that's also less than, than the space. Okay. Otherwise, I can't see a maximum. So this was the condition that was done. And this confirmed, confirms, confirmed de Broglie's uh, wave theory hypothesis, wave hypothesis, that particles act like waves. Hypoth hypoth hypothesis that the wavelength of a particle is given by the, the H divided Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity of the particle. And there's a wavelength that's associated with it that actually can be used to predict where the intensity maximum occur when the electrons get scattered backwards off the crystal. And only at those two angles are they observed. And they're observed exactly at the angle where one expects to have constructive interference. Right? So that was a big step forward. So next time, we're going to look at a case on the back side of your handout. The one I just went through is on the front side. The back side is doing the same type of experiment, but it's a double slit experiment using neutron beams. And they can also verify De Broglie hypothesis. That Neutrons act like waves. Okay, we'll resume on Thursday.